Thank you, David, and it is wonderful to be with all of you, and uh, thank you for the invitation. I know this originated about a year ago, and I'm delighted to be part of this uh, year-long seminar series. Um, so first, let me tell you where I work. Um, this is the research headquarters of IBM. It's about an hour north of the city, and uh, it's this beautiful building that it was designed by Eros Iron, and um, also, he also designed Bell Labs. Uh, this opened in 1961. Uh, IBM Research started uh, almost 80 years ago. Uh, at the time, it was adjacent to uh, Columbia University. And then in 1950s, this building was, was commissioned. And that's where I work every day. And it's, uh, you know, some of you at some point want to come and visit, let me know. Um, it's part of a global network of laboratories uh, uh, around the world. We have uh, a little over 3,000 scientists and, and researchers from a wide variety of disciplines. Uh, you know, lots of physicists and mathematicians and computer scientists, engineers of every type. And um, I think it's, it's a very interesting place because it's very eclectic in the areas. I mean, always within the realm of the world of information and computation. But we do a tremendous amount of work on pushing the limits of semiconductors. Uh, we do a lot of work, of course, in artificial intelligence. Today, we're going to talk about quantum computing. We do a lot of work on cryptography and, and security and, and many areas. And um, just a little bit of a visual tour of just some of the labs. Uh, we have a very large collaboration with MIT devoted to AI. Um, and that's a building on campus. Uh, we have a laboratory in Almaden in California, a little bit south of San Jose. Albany is where uh, we do a lot of semiconductor work. Um, so it's uh, you know, a fantastic facility that puts the limits of logic. Zurich, of course, is a very well-known place for a lot of work that was done on nanotechnology and you know, the invention of STMs and, and many other advancements. And a laboratory in Haifa. And we have laboratories in Tokyo as well and India and uh, in Africa and, and South America as well. So what, as I mentioned, is that the reason that we exist and the community exists is to push uh, the boundaries of the world of, of computing. Um, you know, the story of IBM over 110 plus years has been the story of computing and its relationship to professionals and to the world of business. And within that context, IBM research has always been focused on pushing and inventing what's, what's next in computing. And I'd like to give this little summary that, you know, what's happening in computing right now is this idea of bits, neurons, and qubits coming together, right? Bits and, as an embodiment of the world of, you know, digital logic and high precision computation. Uh, neurons as embodiment of neural networks and the world of artificial intelligence, and qubits, uh, you know, representing the bringing the idea of physics and information together. And while today we're going to talk about quantum, uh, what is really important to realize is that it's actually this decade we are going to see the full force of all of these technologies coming together. And, um, and the possibilities of what will happen when we combine the best of high-performance computing, the best of very large-scale uh, neural networks and AI, and the best of quantum computing coming of age. And we combine it, and perhaps one of the most exciting things we will be able to do is to accelerate scientific discovery. Um, and, you know, and I think that that's something that I know motivates all of us. But today we're going to talk about quantum computing, where we are, and how we're going to bring to reality uh, large-scale quantum computers um, that are capable to realize in the full promise of, of the field. Within IBM Quantum, our mission is twofold, is to bring useful quantum computing to the world, but also because we know that one of the big implications of quantum computing uh, is going to affect very significantly the world of asymmetric encryption for cryptography, to also uh, make the world quantum safe. And what that means is that for many years we've been working very hard and, um, on developing um, quantum safe algorithms. Uh, and um, we participated, of course, with the scientific community and the process with NIST uh, to standardize and provide alternatives to the current encryption protocols. And we're very committed to do what it takes to actually then engage with institutions all over the world to migrate current encryption protocols to the new protocols to enable um, you know, uh, safe, safe computing and safe information processing. But again, Today, I'm going to focus on quantum computing, on the part of it, on where we are. And just briefly to touch, um, I'm going to have a fast forward to this very quickly, but the involvement of IBM research on this field actually traces back to the very origin of the field. So we've been uh, in this journey for many decades, so I would say 
you know, along with semiconductors, probably is our longest running program, right, within IBM Research, many decades in the making. And, um, and as a bit of a historical sort of artifact that might be fun for you to see, in some way the origin for us on our journey in IBM Research dates back to Rolf Landauer. And, um, you know, and Landauer got really interesting at this sort of intersection between the world of physics and information. Uh, he famously did a lot of work around, you know, what is the minimum amount of energy efficiency to do a unit of compute and explore questions like, you know, the thermodynamic reversibility of information processing and the limits and so on. So he was fascinated by this intersection of physics and information. And he hired Charlie Bennett, um, who was then at Harvard. And, um, and they began to, to go down this journey. And Charlie showed me uh, a number of years ago um, this little entry in his notebook, which I think is the first time the words quantum information theory were written down. And um, so, um, you know, I won't go into the story of it. And you'll see actually in the upper right-hand side says false, because at the beginning he was, he was a conversation, you know, with Weissner, and he, <laughs> he was skeptical about it. But it's an interesting little historical artifact dating back to 1970. So that's how long we've been sort of in, on this journey. And, uh, and what is exciting about it is that after you know, many decades, and of course so many people in the community have contributed to lay the foundations of quantum information theory and doing so many building blocks uh, of technology, we're starting to see finally a technology emerge. And just uh, for context setting, two things that I think are always very important to clarify in the context of computing. One is that we shouldn't understand quantum computing as just another step on Moore's law. I mean, quantum computing is not just another faster computer. Um, it's actually something much more fundamental than that. And that quantum computing is the first time that the category of computing itself is branching. And that moving forward, we will have classical computers, and then we will have also quantum computers. And of course, the future is a combination of classical and quantum computers working in concert. One is not going to replace each other. So it's more fundamental than just you know, another step of Moore's law. And the second point, of course, the reason we care is that there's a class of problems that are intractable with classical computers, no matter how large they are. And the best we can do for those classes of problems is to approximate the answers. And sometimes we do a wonderful job using uh, computing and algorith algorithms to approximate the answers of exponential problems where the number of variables is, is indeed exponential. And you know those kinds of problems are present of course, in physics, in chemistry, in mathematics, you know, like factoring and many other examples. Now, it's also important to realize that although quantum computers offer the promise of solving problems that are intractable for classical computers in terms of complexity, that quantum computers will not solve all hard problems, right? That there will be classes of problems that also cannot be addressed with quantum, with quantum computers, but that they're very important problems we care a great deal about. Um, uh, that we will be able to address with that. So that's, that's the, the promise. So let's break it down into what has happened recently, and I will provide a brief summary of the last five, seven years in the field. Where are we going next? And what is the, the ultimate horizon? So over the last few years, I want to break it into, into these pieces, which was the emergence of quantum computing as a scientific tool that is available to the community. Um, and um, I would like to hopefully persuade you that we've entered now a new phase that we're calling quantum utility. And I will sort of explain that. And that one of the things that is very exciting about it is that we're hoping to see the emergence of this category of quantum computational scientists, just like with the advent of computers, right? There was the idea of computer science and computational scientists. That was an, an invention that happened post the creation of the computers. And, um, and hopefully, you know, you'll see what we mean by that. And also, what is the path and why we see actually a road, uh, finally, to be able to deliver the full promise of quantum computing by building large-scale fault-tolerant machines, right? And uh, I will talk about that uh, as well. So, so briefly, what has happened, right? Um, if you look at in the early 2010s, there were certainly dozens, perhaps, of laboratories around the world uh, including at IBM Research, but in other places like Yale and, and, and many other uh, you know, wonderful uh, research institutions that were capable of building some small number of qubits and doing demonstrations uh, of quantum information and quantum information processing with experimental systems. And what we did what that was rather unique was that in May 2016, we built a five qubit 
quantum uh, computer, and we made it available universally on the web. And we didn't know, you know <laughs> how many people were going to be interested um, on this. But it turned out to be um, something quite exciting, right? And since then, we've built over 50 quantum uh, computers of different sizes. And what I'm showing you here is the emergence of a community. So these are all the people around the world that use IBM quantum systems to conduct experiments. Some of them as simple as running their own ver first version of Hello World, right? Of learning how to create uh, you know, qubits and you know, superposition and entanglement and perform measurements. And um, so, you know, over two trillion quantum circuits have been run on actual quantum hardware, right, uh, over the last five years. Um, we created um, an open source uh, project called Qiskit, um, and, and basically it's a quantum SDK, and it's now the most widely adopted open source environment to be able to sort of create, you know, these quantum circuits. And there's been a huge sort of outburst of energy and, um, you know, training, skills, education, curriculum development all over the world um, using this. And, and actually, you know, I'll show you some of the technical results in that of this group and this community, but it's actually one of the areas that gets me the most excited. Not only is the rate of technological progress that we're seeing in the field, but just how much interest there is uh, across the world in the scientific community and the development community to sort of, you know, to learn and to sort of push themselves and go into these um, into this field right now. And, you know, maybe it reminds one of, of like early days of what was happening with machine learning and deep learning in the last, you know, 20 years and the last, you know, uh, decade plus. Obviously a much more community compared to AI, but there's a lot of energy in the field and there's a lot of excitement going on. So there's been over 2,000 scientific publications that have been generated using IBM quantum systems that we've made um, available. You see, uh, I've, I've plotted here, um, the curve of growth around that. So you're seeing this very dramatic acceleration um, of what's happening um, in the field. And just to highlight a few examples from the IBM research team, uh, the IBM quantum team working with collaborators, um, you know, there was some exciting work uh, that was done on creating these, uh, you know, VQE, variational quantum eigensolver algorithms to simulate small molecules. This was done in 2017, which was on the cover of Nature, which was at the time the largest molecule that had ever been simulated uh, using a quantum computer. Um, there was a very interesting uh, you know, paper uh, that Sergey Bribe and, and collaborators did around the fact that you know, for current systems and near-term systems, we can only use shallow circuits, right? So the depth of the circuits is not very deep. Uh, but it was a very nice uh, piece of work to uh, demonstrate a sort of a, a provable gap um, in terms of complexity of what you can do with shallow circuits compared to classical algorithms. So, so that was a very interesting result as well that was published. Um, there was work that, um, um, that was done around quantum super vector machines, so sort of applying it to the field of machine learning and how you could actually um, um, you know, create the supervised learning with quantum enhanced feature spaces. Um, and then there was important result also around error mitigation techniques. So we'll talk about error correction, but basically the problem that was being explored is if you have a noisy machine today and you can measure and characterize the noise present in the system, what are techniques that you can create to mitigate the errors that are present in the machine? And that was another important um, uh, publication that was done recently. I'll say more about that in a second. So as a consequence of all, of all of these sort of advances that were happening in the scientific field with the access to a new tool, um, we established a lot of quantum innovation centers all over the world, uh, mostly with universities. You see here examples of all the universities that now have quantum innovation centers working with us and many others, but also with national labs and research institutions. So this is an area that uh, you know, has been growing very significantly. And I would also say that in addition to the academic and scientific community, there has also been a growing interest, even though you know, relatively small today, but still a growing interest by industry itself. And, um, and there's sort of three classes of problems that folks are interested in exploring. One is everything that has to do with simulating nature. So this matters, of course, for industrial sector companies, right? So if you're in the business of better, building better materials or, you know, there are you know, better molecules for energy or biology and so on. 
So you, that's why you see examples of companies like Bosch and you know, Samsung and Tel and Boeing and so on. Um, there's also been a lot of interest in the financial industry uh, to start exploring implications of finding and revealing structure in data uh, around that. And then also problems related to search and optimization. So this is just a sampler of early sort of pioneers who are forming small teams inside their companies, probably you know, almost always within their R&D organization, that are starting to sort of you know, explore what are the use cases that are relevant to them, get access to these kinds of systems, start developing intellectual property around that. So this is also an emerging uh, element of it. We made a lot of progress, too, in creating um, self-contained quantum systems that don't have to be operated inside IBM anymore. So we created um, the system called IBM Quantum System 1 um, quite a few years ago, four years ago or so. I'm showing you here an example of the system that is installed in the Cleveland Clinic. It's literally in the cafeteria. So, so that's pretty cool, right? Because until recently, I mean, you know, you would imagine everybody had to tinker with the thing. This is a literal system that works with 99% availability. And uh, you know you can run processors, and it's the basis of collaboration. So just to show you that a big part of the equation also has been to engineer this system so that they have high availability, reliability, reproducibility, and performance um, around that. In fact, we've installed now six of these systems um, you know, with Fraunhofer in Germany, with the University of Tokyo in Japan, in Cleveland, i show you an example, in Sherbrooke in Canada. We're putting one in RPI. Uh, the co-founder of NVIDIA gave a large donation to RPI, and we're going to put it in, inside a chapel. Uh, actually, it's going to be a beautiful <laughs> place. And um, we're going to do, um, you know, in San Sebastián, in Spain as well, John say in Riken, it was just recently announced. The interesting thing about that one is that's going to be uh, adjacent also to Fugaku, right? And uh, start, like, the thread of connecting it to high-performance computing and, and more to come. So that's another dimension of it, that like, the technology is robust enough that you can sort of enclose it, self-contain it, install it, right? and you can create quantum computation centers. Now, of course, in this era, even though I'll show you sort of the scale of the systems, one of the things that is like, you know, the hallmark of the challenges of the field is dealing with the errors that are present in the machines. And before sort of having full error correction, you got to deal with those errors that are present. And um, you know, one of the techniques I show you a paper um, that um, that was highlighting that showed sort of like these error mitigation techniques. And one of the things that you can do is is basically instead of executing a single circuit and perform a measurement and get the answer, you actually execute an ensemble of circuits. And the purpose of having these sort of related circuits is to engineer variations of the same program, the same circuit that you're executing, executing but with different levels of noise. And, um, and then use post-processing to find sort of this zero noise point. So basically, the concept it can be as simple as, as this, where you know, you're seeing here the, there's a noise present in the machine, um, and you get an expectation value after you perform the measurement. What you can do is through the controlling the pulses, so the way we send the signals inside the cryostat, we use superconducting technology for quantum computers, is by sending these microwave pulses that travel down um, the cabling that goes into the cryostat. And those microwave pulses, you can basically stretch them or compress them. And that is a way to controllably inject noise into the machine. And by doing that trick, you can basically then run the same circuit again, let's say at twice the noise level. And then once you have a couple of measurements, you can do a zero noise extrapolation, basically extrapolate to say, what would the answer be now that I have, in this case, a very simple line. It can be a more complex curve. What is the zero noise value? And then from that, be able to get the answer. And it turns out that if the system is stable enough, you can do a really good job with this for uh, shallow circuits. So this was um, the result that was published. That was on the, also on the cover of Nature just a few months ago where for a 127 qubit system, there was an experimental result of modeling an icing system, an icing model with 127 spins you know, in the presence of a magnetic field that you know, is hard to do classically. And, um, and then this was an experiment that was done implementing this error mitigation technique. 
for 127 qubits. And this is the first time that that had um, ever been done. And we're very excited about that because this is where we enter sort of like the current moment because we think that that is giving us a new instrument, a new scientific instrument that cannot be emulated classically that is going to offer us this new era of quantum utility. So let's be a little bit more precise and define what we mean by that. So I told you that we have this technique where you can measure and characterize the errors present in the machine and be able to have this approach to mitigate those errors as you execute this family of circuits. So, but there's a cost associated with implementing that. And the cost looks like there's a, a factor that is measured around how fast can you execute the circuits, right? So how fast is your machine? By the way, incidentally, since there's many ways to build quantum computers, we use superconducting um, technology based on uh, a qubit that is based on the transmon qubit that we've been uh, evolving over time. The reason we like superconducting technology compared to ions is, as an example, is because they're much, much faster. They're about a thousand times faster than an ion-based system. So that you know, turns out to be very important for any kind of practical use. Um, then you have like the depth of the circuit, and you have this parameter gamma that goes, there's an, you know, exp an exponent here that is uh, linked to uh, the number of qubits that you have and the depth of the circuit. So what turns out to be really crucial for this to be effective is that the error rate present in the system has to be low enough. That's absolutely key. So why is this possible right now to do these kind of calculations? To make this happen, you basically need to build a device and a system that does a few things really well. The scale of it has to be big enough. So to enter this realm of utility, you have to have 100 plus qubits. The quality of it, and I'll show you some numbers of it, has to be, the error rate has to be low enough for this to be viable. And then the speed of it has to be good, right? Because you've got to execute many circuits around that, and if not, you're not going to be able to get good answers. So we've made a lot of progress over the last few years on each one of these items. So on the scale, the big breakthrough that we've driven, the, I'm showing you here a rendering of our 433 qubit system that we announced last year. But <clears throat> what I want to highlight here is not the number of qubits, but rather that we were able now to build quantum processors that have broken the 2D plane. If you see a lot of examples in the field, a lot of them, they were two-dimensional sort of like qubits where like all the connectivity is local, right? The I.O. is local. It took a lot of work for us to create a multi-layer system where the I.O. right now and the readout and so on are now built on multiple layers of processing. So what it means is that it allows us to have you know, dealing with the signals as you start uh, having more and more qubits is a huge engineering issue. And here we had to develop technology that was, that enabled superconducting through silicon vias, right? So there's a tremendous amount of expertise that had to be developed to have the packaging technology to allow this multi-layer wiring and I.O. management of the quantum processor itself. And without it, it's very hard to actually build large-scale systems. And um, so that was a key, key, uh, an important innovation to enable scale. But that doesn't say anything about the quality of the qubits themselves. So one of the things that we're incredibly excited about is um, the new processor that we have built called Heron that is built on a tunable coupler architecture right now. So, um, so the all the previous technologies of all the processors who had built on IBM were with these sort of like cross resonators that we have. And now we have built um, sort of this new qubit architecture. And what I want to show you, which is one of my favorite plots uh, in quantum uh, computing, and particularly within the IBM quantum program, is the rate of progress of the error rate of our two qubit devices, right, which is the sort of the, the building block of, of quantum computing over time. And um, I want to, you know, sort of, if you start here on the upper left-hand side, when we put the first systems on the cloud in May 2016, the error rates were a few percent, right? So every 100 operations, you had a, a few uh, errors. And what you're seeing here 
is this is all experimental results, right? This is processor after processor after processor. And when you get a couple of things, look at the Heron number here at the bottom. So now you're getting to error rates on a 100 plus qubit device that is 10 to the minus 3. And crucially, um, it's very important to look at the rate of learning, right? So you can sort of extrapolate around that. And um, a very high confidence, right, that we are going to get to the 10 to the minus 4 error rate. And that's a very important number, both the 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus 4, because it's kind of like the physical error rate that you need um, to implement um, with lots of other things, full error correction around that. I'll say more about that in a minute. But what is important is look how much better it is than anything we've ever built. It's by far the best superconducting quantum processor that ever has been built. And, um, and what that tells us now is that we have the combination of, remember back to the equation, like the speed of the processor, the scale of the processor, and the quality of the processor to start implementing these techniques at scale such that we're going to traverse a different exponential. So what you're seeing here is the simulation cost as a function of quantum circuit complexity. So you know, not for every problem, you know, the quantum computers are going to be better. It has to be well suited to the problems that quantum computers can solve. But if you have a high amount of quantum circuit complexity, we know, and that's the black line, that a classical computer faces an exponential cost. We know that ultimately, once we get to a fully quantum error corrected machines, we won't face an exponential cost, but there will be a cost of simulation that you know, uh, follows uh, a more linear progression. That's the, the full promise of quantum computing. And what is going to happen is that because of sort of like this realm that we've entered right now, with error mitigation, and I'll show you more techniques around it and the scale of the systems, we're going to traverse an exponential too in terms of cost, but it's going to be a shallower exponential. And it's going to allow us to start uh, moving in a regime that is uncharted territory. It's a new space to be able to explore problems that we couldn't do before. And basically, the definition that we're putting forth of quantum utility is this sort of frontier where you have a circuit depth that uh, and a circuit width that exceeds sort of a so number of qubits, more than 100 qubits, and a depth of the circuit that you can execute of more than 100 layers around that. And we feel quite strongly that if you can operate in that regime, you're no longer going to be able to simulate it efficiently classical. And I'll give you a couple of implications of that in a minute. And, and I'll show you what's changing in the field as a consequence of these recent results. So this is what's happening. This is a, this is a plot. It's a very interesting um, you know, plot. And this includes all the publications that we could see right? that say, what kind of experiments was the community doing? And how many qubits were they using in performing the experiments that they were using for scientific publications? And what it basically shows is that almost everybody was doing experiments with very few qubits. So even if, if we had access to more, most experiments in the publications have small numbers. And if you say, well, you know, could you simulate those small number of qubits with a classical computer? Well, in fact, most of the work has done, you could simulate it with a PC, an IBM PC from 1981. And if you say, well, if we keep going at that rate, how long is it going to take until we start doing calculations that you couldn't do with, like, you know, you can see here the plot of, hey, you could use a high-performance computer and so on. It's going to take forever. And what has been really interesting since we published this work in Nature uh, a few months ago is the fact that the curve is changing, right? And we've been very sort of vocal in saying, hey, it's time to move and start doing experiments with 100 plus qubits. And just in the last few months, you see here just a list of publications that you're starting to see really interesting work, and, um, and I'll show you more in a minute, um, all of them doing experiments with 100 plus qubits. So one piece of encouragement uh, that I want like to provide this community and so on is to start exploring right, um, sort of in this new realm what's possible. And in fact, one of the things we've done sort of in anticipation for this is to form these quantum and technical working groups. 
across four domains, materials and high performance computing, sustainability, high energy physics, and healthcare and life sciences, where the charter of these working groups, and we invite others who may be interested, is explicitly to say in this realm of utility, what are some experiments that we're gonna go and conduct now that we've entered this regime to start really pushing the boundaries and compared to the approximate methods that we have with classical computing. And, and this is gonna be a very interesting back and forth in the community because even with the, um, the paper that was published on, on, on the Nature article that I was showing you, is, and that was done in collaboration with UC Berkeley um, using some of the best known classical methods, after it was published and there were the results from the quantum computer, then there was a bunch of other groups that said, hey, hey, wait a minute, I can get the answer that you were getting also more efficiently right now. And, but now they're using the quantum computer as the verification. And I think that's really interesting that there's gonna be this interplay between what the best of classical can do and best of quantum can do, and I think that that's gonna be really healthy, right, to go back and forth. But basically, it's open up a new space and a new form of dialogue, and I think we need some of the very best scientists exploring that area. So as a consequence of that, one decision that we have made uh, from the business perspective is from now on, every IBM machine will have more than 100 qubits, right? So we're actually removing <laughs> all the small scale machines and we're updating the entire fleet of machines uh, that we have to um, 200 plus qubits for, for everybody that interacts with this. And so the goal here then is to enable uh, three different sets of audiences to enable, uh, sort of to advance and to utilize this, this new technology. One of them is going to be enterprise developers and software integrators. This requires the highest level of abstraction of the software, right? We can't expect them to know quantum physics, right? Or, uh, and go, you know, sort of all the way down on that level. The second one is quantum computational scientists, sort of this category that we're hoping to emerge in that is capable of combining both quantum and classical um, algorithms, but to enable utility at scale, right? At this scale that we're talking about. And of course, the third, continue to support the community of quantum physicists that are the ones that you know, create these high performance circuits and, and uh, design techniques that implement um, you know, uh, and improve circuit quality and advance error correction approaches and, and many other things. So to do that, there's a whole software stack that um, also uh, has been developed and is being developed. And they have sort of like different levels of abstraction and different levels of latency required for it. So for example, all the way at the level of, you know, if you're sort of um, touching quantum hardware directly, there you're operating at the nanosecond and microsecond regime, and you're really, what you're touching are like gates, right, all the way down and operations, and really these are quantum researchers, right? These are the people touching all the way down to the kernel. I mean, it would be the equivalent in the classical world doing assembly and so on, right? So all the way down. Then above it, you have a Qiskit runtime environment. Um, by the way, in AI world, this would be the equivalent of uh, CUDA runtime, right? So. So you would operate at, at that layer. And here, the latencies in the sort of microsecond to seconds, and, um, and the parallelization that you enable is circuits, right, being parallelized. Then above it, one layer above, is uh, the middleware for, uh, for quantum. This will be, you know, maybe in the AI world by, you know, poor comparisons, maybe PyTorch, right, is operate sort of at that level uh, around that. And then above it, you can have then people who just want to have it as a user function, right, overall. There could be a library uh, that, that you're calling and, um, and you're benefiting from that. So a hierarchy of abstractions in software. So within Qiskit, um, we have this runtime environment that allows you to compile and implement the techniques that I mentioned, for example, like error mitigation and error suppression and so on, and takes care for you of the circuit execution. So it allows you to do the compilation step and then run the circuits, and I'll show you an animation in a minute. But to make life simpler and to start generating this level of abstraction for libraries, there's two core primitives that have been enabled. One is a sampler that given a circuit, it gives you a quasi-probability distribution, and the other one is an estimator that given a circuit and an observable, it gives you an expectation value. 
And now we're starting to have primitives that people can embed into programs, right? So it makes life much easier, right, to understand what is the output that it gives you. And the patterns then of the software, if you want to write a program and benefit from quantum computing, is you got to go through these four steps. You got to be able to map the classical input into a quantum problem, and that's always an art. You got to translate that problem for optimized execution in the quantum machine. Then you got to execute that using the runtime primitives, the estimator and the sampler. And then you got to do a post-processing step using classical resources to create the ensemble and produce the output. So these are the four steps that are required to use it as a tool. And the way that then this is going to manifest itself, even though I showed you self-contained quantum computers, the reality of it is that it's a combination, and this is sort of like the next step that I wanted to share, is a combination of significant amount of classical resources with significant amount of quantum resources. It's not just one machine of quantum. It's actually many machines, and I'll tell you why. And it's actually many classical resources. So let me show you what that is and focus on the roadmap. This is an eye chart, but what I wanted to just highlight is that we have been publishing now for quite a few years, since 2018, a roadmap. And we go out on a limb, and we say, this is what we're going to do. right? So the roadmap says, you know, if you read from the bottom, there's a hierarchy. It goes from the system, the hardware, to what are we going to do for kernel developers, algorithm developers, model developers. And then we say, hey, in 2019, we say we're going to build a 27 qubit machine, then a 65, then 127, then 433, then 1,000, and so on. The check marks are all the things that we met right, from the original roadmap that we published. So we take this super seriously. But today, uh, what I want to share with you is what are the next few years look like? What, what is that going to look like? Because it's a very dramatic change from what we're doing in the past. So the first thing, the first idea is that everything we're architecting from now on is based on modularity. So we are going to build very, very large quantum computers. I told you already that each processor is a multi-layer system but there are going to be many processors connected to one another. And this is where the field of quantum communication and quantum computing are going to merge. So in this, these Heron processors that I told you about, the first system that we've built has multiple Heron processes that are connected with classical information with one another. We're also demonstrating and building links between quantum processors that are quantum mechanical. They include both short-term links, so now you can have qubits that span multiple quantum processors that are connected to one another. And we also have sort of intermediate uh, length links that inside a cryostat there's multiple quantum processors, and this may be like you know, 10 to 30 centimeters in distance, the links between the quantum processors. Um, again, this will be quantum information channels. And then we will have then combination of both short-term links and these medium-term links to allow us to build large number of processors um, that can operate, um, can operate together. And let me give you some estimates on how much of a difference it makes in terms of runtime to have this communication between the processors. So let's say you have a single system, just a single quantum computer. And you have a large quantum circuit that you want to run for your experiment. And one of the things that we have developed is this idea of circuit knitting. So basically, you take the problem and you cut the problem. You cut the circuit into smaller chunks. You've got to be clever about where you cut it. right? So for example, if you're modeling a physical system, maybe you're cutting in the more weakly entangled parts. And, um, and then you're going to face an exponential cost in stitching it together later. But if you're clever about how you cut it, you know we have a lot of classical computation available to us too. So actually, it's worth it. So, but if you take this approach of, I have a long circuit, I cut it, and I send it serially to my quantum computer. Run this piece, run this piece, run this piece, run this piece. Um, so depending, if you cut the circuit like 14 times for some reasonable size uh, problems, it would take you forever, 141 years to be able to run it. So you say, well, OK, so what if, you know, since I have separate circuits, what if I have many quantum computers and I run them in parallel? So you can do that. And, um, but you will need about a couple hundred systems uh, together, and it still take you like you know a year plus. However, just allowing the systems to communicate to one another brings back the overhead dramatically. 
So if you have now a network of quantum computers that are exchanging information with one another while they're performing this, it improves the overhead tremendously to 18 hours. And if instead of that, instead of having classical communication going back and forth between quantum processors, you can have quantum information going back and forth between quantum processors, you can bring the overhead to a millisecond. So quantum communications between processors buys you a lot. It's really important for the architecture of large-scale systems. So what it really is going to look like, you know, a real system, is actually something like this, where you have your program, and you're going to have all of these steps that need to be executed, where there is going to be create your circuit, your parametrized circuit, which is your program. You're going to decompose this problem into many circuits. You're doing all of this with classical computing. You, once you actually determine that, you break it into circuits. And now Qiskit runtime takes all of those circuits and takes care of sending them and orchestrating the runtime environment across the multiple quantum processors that are present in there. And this is where that execution also involves communication. You go through this process iteratively, right, where you're executing this family of circuits to the many quantum processors until you, know, you build the right statistics. So they may be on the order of you know, a few hundred loops. And once you've run all of those things, you use classical process, processing to stitch the answer together and present the answer back to the user. I'm just highlighting all of this because it's not the idea of I have a single quantum processor, I send a machine, and I get something back. The reality now is that this is emerging into much larger systems to be able to do that. And these systems are a reality, right? So, so you saw Avian Quantum System 1. So we've been working for a number of years, and we have now two systems operational of what I'm rendering here, uh, called Avian Quantum System 2. And Quantum System 2 has been architected from the ground up to enable and realize this full modularity. So very large cryostat, the, you know, the sort of the refrigerator uh, for this machine. Uh, I think it weighs 18,000 pounds. It's massive. Um, it can fit in many quantum processors inside it, uh, the Heron processors. And we've architected such that you can combine many of these quantum systems with one another to build very large scale systems. So what you're seeing here is sort of our full sort of like uh, vision of how we are going to build uh, quantum supercomputers. Now, to realize that, you not only, you know, so I, I made a couple of points. I made the point of, hey, um, I can build now processors, quantum processors that have hundreds of qubits. By the way, we're building, uh, we built a processor this year that has over 1,000 qubits. We don't envision that each given processor is going to have numbers that are much larger than that. So we're already at the scale of the module that we're going to have to build very large-scale systems. So we will build each of those processors that have you know, hundreds of qubits. Then there will be many processors connected to one another inside each of those cryostats. And then many cryostats also connected to one another to build large-scale systems. I show you error rates that are you know, 10 to the minus 3, getting close to 10 to the minus 4. So I have both scale, the quality that I need, and the speed that I need. Now the big, big hurdle, the big animal in the field is, all right, but how, if you're going to have that many qubits, how are you going to do error correction, and how big a system are you going to need? And this is what we're really excited about, <laughs> that the code that is best known for doing that is called the surface code. And uh, I'll make some comparisons. But there's a very, very important paper um, that has been put out just a few months ago by Sergey Bravi, Andrew Cross, Jay Gambetta, and others on basically a new code that we're going to use to implement error correction with a totally different level of overhead. So basically, to implement with the surface code, with the best previously widely you know, sort of used in the, in, in the community error correcting code. Well, not used, but like sort of like you know, the, the system that people size of what is going to require to do a fault-tolerant large-scale machine. Basically, if you want about 1,000 qubits that are error corrected, you need you know, estimates. It could be as high as 20 million 
qubits, physical qubits. That's a lot of qubits. That's very hard to build uh, machines of that scale. With this new code, um, you can do that with about 100,000 physical qubits. There's a massive difference between the two. What's the price you pay? Well, the way this code um, you know, has been developed, the reason people like the um, surface code is because you can implement it with near neighbor connections. And it was 2D. Like you could just implement it on the surface of um, the qubit plane. Here, the trade off you need to make is you got to make a degree. Oops. Uh, Tara, do you have the, the password? <laughs> you need a, um, a degree six connectivity, meaning that you have a qubit, you got to have measurements with nearby qubits, but you got to break the plane. You got to connect with qubits that are not immediately adjacent to yours. But I told you that we have mastered the art of breaking the plane. So you need another coupler called a C coupler that couples, that basically goes from a qubit, goes out of plane, goes through one of the routing layers, comes back down. And if you're able to do that, then you have a totally different level of overhead. So um, we're very excited about this because this is going to be the path to implement large-scale, fault-tolerant machines. And uh, we have all the ingredients necessary um, to make that happen. So we've announced publicly, we announced it during the G7. Uh, we announced it in the context of our collaboration that we were doing with the University of Tokyo and the University of Chicago and IBM, um, that we intend to build uh, a 100,000 qubit, physical qubit supercomputer um, by 2033. And we're going to build it in, um, with our engineering philosophy that we always have. It's not, we're not going into a black hole and coming out with the machine. We're going to build, like we continue to do, machine after machine after machine that is going to have more qubits, more depth. We see a continuous path. So we've never bought into the philosophy if you have nothing and then you have like the final answer. We are going to go step by step. But I wanted to put it in the context of like, the science that, that it can enable. So, so what you're seeing here plotted is the circuit width, the number of qubits that you have, versus the circuit size. How many gates can you implement? How deep is the circuit that you can implement? And what you're seeing here is current known algorithms and problems and a reasonable estimate of the size for problems from condensed matter physics to chemistry to optimization to machine learning to cryptography like Shore and so on. And you see some color coding. And you're seeing the dashed lines is the pre-utility regime. Basically, this is what we're saying is like, let's not do a whole lot more of that, right? Because you can do that classically and, and so on. So hey, things have to be over 100 qubits. They have to have enough depth, right? There have been enough experiments with small number of qubits done. Let's operate in the new regime. So I think what is exciting from a scientific discipline for this emergence of quantum computational scientists and obviously like the physicists who are interested in quantum information is twofold. One is how do we start taking those problems and have a more concerted effort to push them to the left given that we're going to have these machines? So. What we are already in this past this threshold of shadow lines, but basically what you're seeing here, right, you know, that I'm being a little bit um, opaque, is the kinds of machines and the regime that the scientific community is going to have available to them. So I think this is really exciting, right, because there's a huge both unexplored region and problems of great relevance to a broad variety of scientific communities that are going to be possible now to be tackled uh, year after year um, you know, over, the next, over the next decade. And um, 
So anyway, so this is an, a challenge and an opportunity for everybody here, uh, if you're interested, that we will have machines and capability to go over all of those uh, shaded lines. If you want to uh, learn a little bit more or read about more, like we, um, you know, last year, um, we uh, published this, this piece of work of the future of quantum computing with superconducting qubits that gives a good overview of some of the, the many areas and the challenges. And the only advertising I can do, just given the timing, is like, just stay tuned for the quantum summit. It's just in a few weeks. And I think some of those things that I was a little bit more opaque uh, will reveal themselves in more, uh, in more force as to what's coming right in the, in the next decade. So with that advertisement, I will stop and thank you. <laughs> Fascinating talk and a uh, little tease about the future. The immediate future and the, the more distant future. The very immediate future, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we uh, have time for some questions. Thank you. That was a great talk. I was wondering, you mentioned like building these bigger and bigger machines is also very expensive. So can you say a bit more about like the efforts to make this also cheaper and more accessible, like in more number of computers? Yeah. Um, yeah, so... So... First of all, our, our philosophy on accessibility has been to enable both cloud access for the community so that they can have you know, as efficient an environment, like you don't have to build laboratories and so on to be able to do that, and then have dedicated systems for quantum computation centers or quantum innovation centers that support a community. So for example, you see in universities or in research institutions where like a few decades ago, maybe they put an HPC cluster and then they supported a whole community you're starting to see something equivalent where there's an effort that now serves a community and then that makes it, you know, it's kind of like an institutional investment that makes it broadly available. So that has improved it dramatically and that's why you're seeing this exponential growth in publications around that. Then to answer your question, longer term, if you try, that's why this issue of innovations and error correction are so crucial because if you say, well, let's build a, quantum supercomputer with 20 million qubits. Like when you actually run the numbers around that, it's just not viable, right, anytime soon, right? And the cost of it is stratospheric. And the cost is dominated uh, by the electronics, honestly. That's what dominates the cost, the IO and the electronics. The chips themselves and so on, that's doable. The cryogenics is expensive but doable, but the electronics is what eats your life. So that's why reducing that dramatically and how do you, you know, sort of push the boundaries of, um, you know, we've gone from FPGAs to CMOS and cryo CMOS, the wiring signals, and how do you actually lower the cost of that is really crucial around that. In the end, I think building systems of that scale, it's a supercomputing project, right? Which is, but you know, classical supercomputers are not cheap either, right? But we think it's going to be commensurate with those. And the important part of it is obviously the problems that they can solve are intractable no matter how much money you spend on the classical thing. So, so in terms of, in the end, for the right problems from energy efficiency and cost, that's the beauty of it. It's like it's massively better than the classical machines for that. Uh, do you want to just hit the button? There's a button that people... Uh, you showed on the slide that uh, Qiskit is about two levels away of abstraction away from application users. So uh, who is working on those abstraction layers to the point where you're going to have an API that classically trained programmers are going to be able to use? Yeah, we're working on that ourselves in the community, and that's why I was showing this example of patterns and um, functions, because functions in the end can be extracted as a library with an API call. So you, you'll see a lot more coming up in a few weeks around like elevating the software abstraction. Uh, around that, but uh, but I mean, and it's work that is not just about you know us alone, right? It's like with the community to do that. It's come a long way, but we have more ways to go, right? Uh, around that, but it's it's now at least at the level where you have well-defined functions, 
of what they do, and then you can call those functions. You don't have to know any quantum physics or anything, and you can sort of embed them into sort of like libraries and use your favorite like you know Python environment or or so on to run them. Which is for us is a huge priority because unless you make it happen, then you're still in a small community, right? And and so the idea is now to allow the developers in general and scientists who are not quantum physicists, you know, quant you know, to use it, right? And and that's but like it's it's happening. I mean, it's not in the far future. It's already sort of like you're seeing the beginning of it, and you're going to see a lot more of it. It's a big push. Uh, we also have a lot of interest in using, you know, since AI, you know, there's a lot of work we're doing on AI for coding and so on, is to um, utilize that to help a lot with programming as well. Thank, thank you. Great talk. Very thank inspiring. You. I'm wondering, uh, do you see any systematic advantage of uh, other um, methodologies for implementing qubits? And could you comment on that if, if it's... Uh... Yeah. Um, it's a good question. There are many ways to build quantum computers, but but um, what we like about superconducting, and then I'll tell you about some of the advantages of others, uh, is this combination, is this triangle. So the way we think about it is you got to do size, right? Remember, in the end, you're going to have to build a large number of them, right? Even if you implement, you know, things like these new error correcting codes, you have a lot of qubits you're going to need. Uh, how fast you can run them. And then also uh, the error rate present. For example, if you do things with ions, the nice thing about it is in a university context, it's a really good system. Why? Because I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's relatively easy, easier in context for super experts, to build a small number of qubits, dozens of them or so on. You can do this with neutral atoms too and so on, and have an experimental system that has really good coherence, right? Because you're using you know, an ion-based system, the coherence is so much better than, for example, a superconducting system. And really conduct like, you know, really good science and do education and research around it and so on. Whereas you know, building a large-scale superconducting thing, it's much harder because you need semiconductor fabs and all that stuff. So, so it has advantages in an academic setting. And you can do really great work around that. But if you're in the business of ultimately doing a thing that you know, isn't the, the purpose is not just to publish papers, but actually to run um, uh, real problem solving in the world and solve it and scale it, it's very hard to do. Right? Because the coherence is very good, but they're very slow. Right? And then the scaling is going to be a huge issue over time. But I think you will see in the f next few years, right? like for example, you're seeing with neutral atoms and so on, you will see exciting work around that. But I just remind you of like this triangle that depends on what you're trying to do. And we're trying to do the long run of the whole thing in a system that can really scale. So, but those are trade-offs. Ions give you great coherence, very slow. Other ones give you less coherence, but they're much faster. So you got to trade it off. Um, yeah, could you say more for these uh, larger scale platforms about the coupling between nodes? It seems like there might be some issues with coherence and non-locality and also cool cooling the connection and so forth. Yeah, so there's a, lot of, um, that, there's a lot of issues. So you can get really good fidelity, like for both the C coupler that I mentioned and the very close proximity, you can get really good fidelity numbers and, and, and some speed. The moment you start like, you know, going further distance, uh, both the performance and the quality of it is much lower. Uh, compare what you can do. However, that's what I was showing a little bit the heuristics of the trade-off that even if you can do modest levels of communication, you gain a lot, right? So, so then the cleverness is around taking the problem on how you partition it and how you accommodate for that. But then the, the software needs to be aware enough of all of those things, right? It's like this link has lower fidelity than these other links. So, so this is what if you expose all of that to the user, you kill them in terms of complexity. So that is all what like Kiskit, you know, what the low level has to do. Be aware of all the hardware, be aware of all of these different fidelities and so on, and then present an abstraction of it that basically something magically happened and it works behind the scenes. But you have to, your point is well taken, you have to accommodate for the fact that the links have different quality levels. Right? And uh, but you're much, much better off having the links and not having them. That's my point, right? And it's crucial to make it work. Okay, let's take uh, one last question. Thank you. I uh, appreciate your wonderful presentation. A uh, question about the nature of uh, quantum errors. Suppose you run a, a program on a quantum computer without error corrections. 
and you keep running it a gazillion times. How long is it before you see that the results are converging at some point? Um, they wouldn't, I mean, so, so the problem of it is that um, the challenge of building a quantum computer is this balance between isolation and connectivity, right? So if you isolate the system perfectly, right, you know, you can control it and prevent sort of like the coupling of the external energy fields of the world and making your system decohere. But if it's so perfectly isolated, you cannot send the information in and out. So it's this trade-off of isolation and connectivity around that. And, um, and what happens is you have a certain amount of coherence time, right? Before this, before you have full error correction, which is a question you're asking, before your qubit essentially become bits, right? And you don't get around that. Um, so you don't, just by running it again and again and again, I mean, you can get some statistics, but it helps you only if you do the techniques that I mentioned before, where you run small variations of the same circuit again and again in such a way that if you have a stable enough system, it reveals something intrinsic about the noise present in the system. And through the combination of all of those runs, you can suppress the noise that has revealed itself by running all those circuits. If you just say, I run the thing over and over again without doing those techniques, you don't, you know, it doesn't help you deal with it. So hopefully that answers. So, so it's very helpful to run it many times, but with the cleverness of doing variations in such a way that you can have some revealing of the noise present and take something out. Wonderful. So thank you so much for fascinating. Thank you.